Hi, this is Robin from 8-Bit Show and Tell. Before we get started today, just have a couple things about the last episode. Apparently that technique that I was showing you where you go uh, if x and y then a substitute instead of doing the and going if x then if y then and how this second option is faster. Apparently the name for that in modern programming languages is short circuiting. Uh, it will automatically test X and if it's false, it will immediately evaluate the whole thing as false. It'll just move on. And so that's what we're simulating here. So the term is short circuiting. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Thanks to everybody who commented about that. Special shout out to Jeff Stack. He went and took a look at this issue of Run Magazine that prompted the video in the first place. Well, on page 93 is what we were looking at. It just so happens, just back a little ways on page 78, from George, a fellow Canadian in Windsor, Ontario called faster if thens and it's exactly about how you can replace each end with a then if it's amusing that same information was right here in that same issue so now this episode i'm actually not going to be doing any programming i expect that i'll be programming again the next episode i have a problem here is this setup that i've been using i like using this case here for because it has the monitor stand built in and just keeps everything nice and tidy but it has a huge drawback is that I can't get access to the ports on the back of the Commodore while I'm using it. And I have to like remove the monitor and open this up. It's a real hassle. Uh, specifically for my next programming videos, I want to start using the cartridge port. I have various things, a super snapshot cartridge and some other things I want to make use of because I'm going to get into a little bit of assembly language or machine language. I want to disassemble some stuff. This case is just getting in the way now. So I'm going to retire it, and I think I've decided that I'm going to start using a 128D, uh, still in 64 mode for now, but it'll give me the built-in monitor stand uh, and easier access to the cartridge port and so on. I've had some people asking about this case, so I want to give you a quick rundown on what it's like, and also when I set the 128, I'll do that and show you a trick or two about using the 128. Uh, so stick around for that. Like I said, next episode, uh, the programming will continue. I also want to do a little mini segment during each of my episodes, which I think I'll call new 8-bit stuff. Each episode, I'm just going to really quickly feature something that's being made that's new for 8-bit, uh, something I think is good. So for this first episode, Freeze 64, made by my friend Vinny in the UK, issue... 23 just arrived here. It's from the UK, uh, but he ships it to me here in Canada. It's quite affordable and every issue is great. This one's a tribute to the music of Ben Daglish, who sadly passed away recently. Ben was a great musician, most famous for the music on uh, The Last Ninja. Every issue, there's these cute little uh, trading cards here. This one's for the game Bounder. There's all kinds of interesting information about new games that are upcoming, interviews with various Commodore programmers, and all kinds of really interesting cheats for various games, sometimes cheats that are built into the game. There are a whole bunch of issues here. He has a lot of back issues for sale too, so if you happen to grab issue 20, Check out the back page. My Commodore 64 Heaven. Who's that guy with the beard? Then he did a little feature on my collection, including my prototype C64 DTV and my very rare uh, dual FD2000 three and a half inch disc drive. I'll probably get around to talking about those in uh, future episodes. So stick around. There's my game collection and so on. Anyway, free 64, I'll put some information about it down below. So before I decommission this setup, I just wanted to take a quick tour through what I've got going on here. 
got a regular C64, but you'll notice it's inside this metal case here, which has a 1702 sat on top of it. And uh, beside I have the 1541. Also hiding back here, I got this little video capture device, which is what I've been using to grab the video from the screen. These cases were actually in use in public school. Well, I shouldn't just say public schools, but I think they were intended for school boards to buy, to put their Commodore 64s in uh, when they're deployed out to the classroom. This particular one says Robert Moore School, which is a school not in my city, but here in the Northwestern Ontario region of Canada. I know my own school board in Thunder Bay had them. At first I thought it was just an Ontario thing, but somebody on Twitter told me their school in California actually had them as well. It's almost like the uh, the case gives it a little bit of a pet appearance. And I can see that school boards would like to put the computer in a case like this, partly to prevent theft, but of course uh, it doesn't make the, the computer totally like kid-proof or abuse-proof. The built-in monitor stand is also convenient just to reduce the footprint in our schools, uh, they would put one of these just on a regular desk and the Commodore and the monitor would fit nicely there with a 1541 off to the side. And here at the side of the computer, there's a cutout so you can see that you have access to the joystick ports, the power switch. The power cord runs in, comes out of the side here. Sorry, I'll move all the junky cables. I'm using these video cables because my capture box only does composite, doesn't do S-video, and so I've kind of had to hack together just a few cables to get the video signal so I could both see the picture on the actual 1702 and still have it run to the capture box. But you can see there's just a couple openings here, and this is the reason I'm getting rid of the setup, is because I can't get at the cartridge, I can't change the cartridge, and I can't even... <laughs> Basically, it's just too inconvenient to use for what I want to do going forward. I'm going to take this monitor off and just show you the inside quickly. And here, just ignore the junk back there. <laughs> Here's the top. You can see it lifts up. And by the way, the, a lock could be installed here. You open it up and see at the whole top here, there's a large hinge across the back. And there's a bit of cable management. Not much, but here. And back in here is a clip that can be used uh, with, with a lock up above here to lock the enclosure. It had been modified with a button in the side here. Whatever, there used to be a jumper coming off of here, but uh, I don't know what happened to that or what that was used for. Maybe it was a reset button. I suppose if I was really wanting to use this, I could try using that button and wired in to the reset button on my super snapshot or something, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, and you can see I've just kind of jammed the power supply in here. There is a bracket right here that can be used for it, but unfortunately it's too small for this power supply. I believe this case was made for the very earliest Commodore 64 units, which include a slightly smaller power supply. Without uh, These ones have kind of this ribbing around them. I am just using a regular C64 brick, but I tested it first. I tried to find one of my oldest power supplies that are smaller. I have several, but I tested them with my multimeter ahead of time, and each one of them had particularly high voltage on the 5 volt. You might know that these are notoriously unreliable. They often fail by the voltage going much higher than the specification and they actually kill the Commodore in the process. I tried to find one of my smaller ones, but when I tested the voltage, they were all too high out of spec. I think it should be a maximum of 5.1 or 5.2 volts. They were reading 5.3, 5.4, so I did not want to risk one of my computers just for the sake of making this uh, look more tidy here. Now you can see this is the power cord here that runs out the side and in. So I'll unplug that, feed that through, and the computer itself lifts out here. I'll unplug the video cable 
the IEC disk drive cable, and I also even had a cassette drive in there, and the computer just lifts out. And at the back here is one bigger hole that I've passed through a few cables through power cable, video cable, and IEC, that's the disk drive cable. That's this little unit that was in use in schools. I'm going to clean this up and go get the 128D and put it here and show you a couple things about that. Just taking a quick look here in my closet. Got 128s. These are all my Vic 20s here. Vic 20, uh, some Model 100 TRS 80s back in there. Amiga 500s back there. 128 uh, flat 128s. Uh, 128D keyboards. Some of them are really yellowed. There's a pretty nice one. I'll I think I'll use that. And then and back behind all these. Yeah, there's my 128Ds. What have I got? One, two, three, four, five of them. Anyway, I'll I gotta pull some more stuff out here, but just thought you want to take a look around here. Oh back there's my 64 bread boxes, and even further back are 64 C's. Hard to see in there, it's pretty dark. Up here I got all my boxed Commodores. Uh, there's another layer behind here. So, oh, my Commodore Webbit. <laughs> Bizarre. Something with a C64 brand name. Okay, I've got my Commodore 128D set up here. Unfortunately, my keyboard case is uh, very yellowed. It could definitely use some retro brighting. That's not something uh, I'm prepared to do right now for this video. I, I do want to give that a try, but don't want to be doing that indoors. Uh, it's the Canadian winter right now, so it might be something I'll, I'll try in the summer, or I'll research more options about doing it indoors. This is a 1902A Commodore monitor. I believe this was the monitor that was usually sold with the Commodore 128. It does both composite and RGB signal, so it's good for both the 40 and 80 columns on the C128, and that can be switched. Right down here there's a CVBS, which is composite, and the RGB switch here. If you haven't seen a C128D before, I'll give you a quick tour all around it. Uh, it has a built-in 1571 compatible drive. Here's a better look at the keyboard. See that the function keys are along the top right, and they're the same as the Commodore 64 keys, except the arrangement of them here. The numeric keypad is handy. It's only available in C128 mode. Uh, when you're in Commodore 64 mode, the numeric keypad isn't available. Not directly, although there are some ways that you can actually read some of these extra keys, even in Commodore 64 mode. And here we have a reset button, which is really handy. Uh, there's a lot of times when you're using Commodore computer where you'd like to reset the computer but not have to power cycle it. And on the 128D that is built in, unlike on the Commodore 64. There's also a recessed drive reset button so you can independently reset the disk drive. That's something I barely ever used but it's nice to have there. And here's two joystick ports. I've been calling these joystick ports all my life. Really, they're called control ports. I can just make out along here. Control port one and control port two. And while we're up close, we'll look. This pin is actually being damaged and I <laughs> did a lousy job of replacing it. Someday I'm gonna fix that for real. And this big connector here is actually for the keyboard. It's a great big, uh, what is it, DB25? And over here is the cassette port. Yep, even the 128D does have a cassette port for compatibility, even though I'd assume uh, most owners of it never use that port much. And here on the back side, we have the power switch, standard power connector because the C128D has the power supply built in. Here's the user port, which is commonly used for things like modems. RGB output used for the 80 column mode. This is the RF out, used for hooking up to a TV. 
This is the channel select uh, in North America, channel three or four. And this is the 40 column out video output and audio. And this is the IEC port for the disk drive cables. And then here's the cartridge port. And just like the control ports, which I was calling joystick ports, the cartridge port is actually called the expansion port. It isn't just for game cartridges. It actually exposes the whole system bus. You may even have expansions like a RAM expansion unit or even a processor upgrade like the Super CPU. This is the metal case. Some people call this a C128DCR because the original 128 actually had a plastic case and somehow they cost reduced it and put it in a metal case. That didn't really sound right to me. It sounds like the plastic one should be the cheaper one. In North America, I think we always just call these 128Ds here in Canada or my friends in the US. You can see here that the model is the C128D, but down here on the FCC ID, it does say 128DCR at the end. Okay, so that's a quick little tour around the 128D that I'm going to be using for some future videos. But before we wrap up, so I'll explain one simple, I don't know if you want to call it a trick or tip, about the 128D. For a while, this was my main development computer. When I was doing a lot of C64 development uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s on the machine itself, before I started using emulators and cross assemblers. And one annoyance, as awesome as the 128D is, one thing is that expansion port is located way back here and that might not be a big deal when you're just using a stock machine, but when you have a cartridge or other piece of hardware plugged into the expansion port and you're using it regularly, it actually becomes a real pain. Now you might not, this might sound like a trivial thing, but normally a Commodore 64, you know, you're right here at the keyboard and then you just reach just behind, not just a few inches back behind here, and you have access to the, to the cartridge. For example, I'd be using a Super Snapshot often, which is a utility cartridge, and it has a button on it you need to press to freeze the machine and gain access to the monitor, all kinds of features that I would use in development. And when you're sitting down at the desk, it's actually a really awkward reach. It's pretty much like you have to stand up every time you want to hit that button, but really it should be just as accessible as... Uh, a key on the keyboard for a program where it's just another, you're, you're using it just as often as, as many of the keys on the keyboard. In fact, if you, if you don't believe how far it is, I'm going to take the phone off the tripod here. A little journey. Here we are at the keyboard. And here we are going past, 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 and way down there. That's the button on the top left corner of the Super Snapshot. What I ended up doing was rotating it. Okay, so all I've done is rotated it so the front of the computer is now over on the left side and with the disk drive. And now the expansion port is right here, quite easily accessible. And a bonus is that now the keyboard cable reaches a lot longer in its normal orientation. You use up quite a bit of keyboard cable just getting to the front of the computer. But in this case, you can sit further away from the monitor if you wish. Of course, then you're further away from the expansion slot again. So this here is called the EX3, and it gives you three slots. CMD made this back in 1994, and they also made a model that has one of the, the, the final expander actually oriented. Instead of being vertical, it's horizontal. And that's good for certain devices like a super CPU and others that shouldn't be facing upright. And it also has these dip switches on it. And you can individually configure 5 volts, the game line, IO1, IO2, ROM high, ROM low. Individually you can turn those on or off. And you can actually combine certain cartridges uh, that would normally conflict in IO space. And instead, you can actually get them to play nice together. So a common use is to plug the expander in the back here, and then the Super Snapshot cartridge, and the RAM expander unit. 
I'll go more in depth with this in a future episode where I show you the assembler that I used called Turbo Macro Pro plus RU. Can't remember who the original developer was, but a demo group style, particularly its leader Elwex, uh, who's a friend of mine. He developed a version of Turbo Macro Pro that supported the RAM expansion unit, and it was the most amazing development for me <laughs> for doing assembly in, in the late 90s. This was my environment, and it was very fast, very efficient, and uh, I'll, I'll get into more depth in it later. And you can imagine some people would expand even further. Like, this is a pretty small unit, relatively speaking, but if you plug some bigger cartridges in here, like a, a Super CPU, a RAM link, which I don't own, uh, and then you might want to put some more cartridges on the end, you can imagine that this would get ridiculously big. It's unfortunate that Commodore never released an 8-bit model that had internal slots like an Apple II, but this was sort of the best solution there was for it. Okay, that's it. Next episode, we'll get back to some programming. I'm looking forward to using this setup and being able to make use of my Super Snapshot cartridge to do some machine code disassembly, uh, to have easy access to a reset button even. Thanks again for watching. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe. And I've got a lot more videos planned, so stay tuned for that. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.